Hello and welcome back to Grockett's OGTV. This is the GMAT edition, and we are doing some reading comprehension. Let me get my pen here. There we go. <clears throat> um, my name is Jim Jacobson, like it says up in the upper right, taught by Jim Jacobson. That's a picture of me, although I guess it's kind of small, so you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell. And uh, like I said, you're watching Grockett.com. This is the GMAT edition, where we're going through the official guide to the test. Uh, the twelfth edition. So, if you're using the eleventh edition, eleventh edition of the OG or older, um, some of the questions will be the same, but I think the pagination will be different, and of course, some of the questions will be different. So, this really will only make sense if you're using the twelfth edition to the test. Um, we left off um, in the middle of the reading comprehension section last time, and today we're going to do two more passages. We are on page. Let me get that on the screen here. Page three eighty four. And we're on question number 64. And as always, I give you a little bit of time to read the passage, around four minutes, because that's uh, I want you to have time to at least uh, read it somewhat thoroughly. And um, I'll take notes during, during that time, and you can either do the same or just sit there and wait for me to do it. And then we'll go through the questions as best we're able. So um, I don't have that much else to say about it other than, hey, let's get started.
Okay, we'll stop there. So, um, passage overall is about uh, legal protection uh, versus import competition and how, at least in the U.S., the implementation of those laws has not actually necessarily been to the advantage of U.S. companies. <clears throat> we, we kind of go into more detail about that until we get to the end, where we have um, an example um, of, of a, an outrageous case. So, um, let's take a look at those questions. Oh, and again, it's always worthwhile to consider whether the author is advocating any particular course of action. Um, in this particular case, I didn't feel like the author was saying, um, you know, that anything should or shouldn't be done, just that it doesn't always work out the way that it was intended. Uh, so, number 64 then. Um, the passage is excuse me, the passage is clearly concerned with, so this is our main idea question, um, is it A, arguing against the increased internationalization of United States corporations? So here again, uh, the author wasn't arguing against anything, so no matter what came after those first couple words, uh, choice A really couldn't be right. Uh, choice B, uh, warning that the application of laws affecting trade frequently have unintended consequences, or has unintended con consequences. Singular, since the the word application is the subject of the sentence. Um, so, yes, there are definitely unintended consequences. In fact, um, that's more or less what happens from par paragraph 2 onward. So we'll save B as a contender. C, demonstrating that foreign-based firms receive more subsidies from their governments than United States firms receive from the United States government. What foreign governments do is outside the scope of the passage. It's not covered, and therefore there's no way it could be the main idea. And there we go. My pen froze. Okay. Uh, D. Is it advocating the use of trade restrictions for dumped products but not for other imports? Again, the author is not advocating one course of action or another, so um, that's not it. It's not advocating anything. Uh, e. Recommending a uniform method for handling claims of unfair trade practices. The author doesn't really recommend anything either, um, let alone a uniform method. That's not something that gets mentioned in the passage. So that leaves us with B, uh, that uh, these laws have unintended consequences. On to number 65. It can be inferred from the passage that the minimal basis for a complaint to the International Trade Commission is which of the following. So it can be inferred, um, that's about the most obvious way that they can tell you that it's an inference question. Probably the only more obvious way is uh, if it said an inference that could be made is which of the following. So it means that what we're looking for in the passage is almost stated but not quite stated. So it's almost there but not quite. Um, and the part where we hear about uh, businesses being able to make a complaint, I think that was towards the beginning of the passage. Um, yeah, so around line uh, 10, it says, um, even when no unfair practices are alleged, the simple claim that an industry has been injured by imports is sufficient grounds to seek relief. So we would want something that is a simple inference, a very uh, short logical leap that could be made off of that statement, I think. Let's take a look. Um, can we infer that the minimal basis for a complaint is a foreign competitor has received a subsidy from a foreign government? Again, what foreign governments do is not actually in question or even discussed in the passage, so it's all about the U.S. government, so it's not A. Uh, B, is it that a foreign competitor has substantially increased the volume of products ships shipped to the United States? Um, I'm just looking to see where something like that may have been uh, mentioned. Well, uh, so that, that certainly is a possibility of the circumstances under which a complaint could be made. However, we don't really have passage support for the idea that it's, um, that it's an increased volume of products. That may be what, what triggers some companies to, or what encourages some companies to file a complaint, um, but we don't really have support for that. It's the simple claim that an industry has been injured by imports, and it's without reference to the volume of those imports, so I don't think we can infer that. 
Actually, let's keep that one in the running because that's possible. Um, C, a foreign competitor is selling products in the United States at less than fair market value. So that gets mentioned right before in the previous sentence. It says another 340 charged that foreign companies dumped, quote unquote, dumped their products in the United States at, quote, less than fair value. So now, unfortunately, it's the very next sentence that says, even when no unfair practices are alleged. So dumping at less than, at less than fair value is considered an unfair practice. And apparently the minimum level for a complaint is below that. So it's not C. Um, uh, D, the company requesting import relief has been injured by the sale of imports in the United States. So that, that's what the part I read before sounds like, you know, uh, even when no unfair practices are alleged, the simple claim that an industry has been injured by imports is sufficient grounds to seek relief. So we'll keep that one too. Um, and then E, the company requesting import relief has been barred from exporting products to the country of its foreign competitor. Again, that whatever, we don't care about what other countries are doing. I mean, we do in real life, but this passage does not. So for, for these few minutes, we don't care what other, uh, what other countries are doing. So we have it down between B and D. We have um, the foreign competitor has sub substantially increased the volume of products shipped to the United States or um, that the company requesting import relief has been injured by the sale of imports. Of the two, choice D much more closely matches that bit at the end of the first paragraph that I read. There's really nothing about the volume of products. So we go back to eliminating B and we choose D. And then I erase. I guess I didn't really have to narrate that. I just, I'm not a big fan of the dead air thing. A little bit of dead air never hurt anybody, but it is to be avoided because if somebody tunes in now and doesn't hear anything because I'm busy doing something else, uh, they might think the program isn't done. Anyway, so we are on to page 385, question number 66. The last paragraph performs which of the following functions in the passage? When this happens, we want to go back and just review briefly what actually happens in the last paragraph. Um, and from my notes, and if you didn't take notes, you could just go glance at that. Um, uh, that the last paragraph is this brazen case where a um, U.S. company that's actually owned by a Dutch conglomerate uh, lodges a complaint um, to the ITC against a Canadian company, which turns out to be not only a um, U.S. company, but one of the second largest domestic producers of, in this case, salt, rock salt. So, uh, basically, uh, the last paragraph is an example of, of um, how convoluted and how, uh, how convoluted these uh, legal protections versus import competition can be and how foreign companies can use it against domestic ones. So we want something like that in our answer choice, I think. So, does the last paragraph summarize the discussion thus far and suggest additional areas for research? No, it doesn't summarize and it doesn't suggest research. Definitely not A. It presents a recommendation based on the evidence presented earlier. There's no recommendation. Uh, so uh, this, uh, th see how easy it is to eliminate these? It's, it's only taking me as long to eliminate them uh, as it does because I'm reading them out loud. If I were um, doing these to myself, um, the first one, I would stop after it says it summarizes the discussion. I would just say, no, and I would cross it off. And then B, it presents a recommendation. I would stop there and cross it off. But if I did that, you wouldn't necessarily be able to follow my reasoning. So, you know, everything, ta everything takes longer when you do it out loud. You won't be doing this out loud on your real GMAT. If you do, they will probably kick you out because you're supposed to be quiet. So anyway, um, C, it discusses an exceptional case in which the results expected by the author of the passage were not obtained. Okay, so um, for in the beginning of this, this is one of those half right, half wrong things. It is an exceptional case. The, the author actually says it's a brazen case. Brazen means uh, bold or outrageous. And um, it's that. It's certainly an outrageous case, but it's not an exceptional case in the more literal definition of exception. Um, Exceptional can just mean outstanding, and that could be synonymous with brazen. Exceptional uh, ultimately, though, means um, 
having the qualities of an exception, something that is not according to the rules. So um, the exceptional case in which the results expected by the author of the passage were not obtained, no, this is actually uh, exactly what the author would have expected uh, because the author says that these legal protections and the ITC and stuff, it's a little bit messed up. It's not C. In fact, C is a 180 of what we're after. Um, D, it introduces an additional area of concern not mentioned earlier, no. Uh, and that leaves us with E, and so if we were in a hurry, we could just select this one pretty confidently because it's really pretty clearly not any of the other answer choices. But um, E says, it cites a specific case that illustrates a problem presented more generally in the previous paragraph. The previous paragraph talked about how the foreign companies can use the ITC against U.S. companies. And then here in par paragraph four, we have exactly that happening. So... Um, yeah, that's awesome. That's that's totally what we were after. That does not look like a happy smile. There, that's a little bit better. Um, it, it is, in fact, answer choice E. All right, on to 67. Okay, whoops. Let's get rid of this. 67. The passage warns of which of the following dangers? Well, you know, so there's not a particular part of the passage that really specifically, well, I don't, you know, just off the top of my head, I don't remember a specific warning in there. The whole thing is about how it hurts more companies than it helps and how foreign companies can use it against the United States. So it'll probably be something like that. Um, a, companies in the United States may receive no protection from imports unless they actively seek protection from import competition. The passage does not say that. Um, that's going way too far beyond what the passage says. It just says that one of the ways that uh, companies can get import protect protection is by going through the ITC. Does the passage warn that companies that seek legal protection from support... Or, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes there's problems reading out loud because your brain decides that it's seeing other words other than, or maybe that's just my brain. Anyway, companies that seek legal protection from import competition may incur legal costs that far exceed any possible gain. Legal costs are never mentioned, so it's totally not B. Uh, C, companies that are United States owned but operate internationally may not be eligible for protection from import competition under the laws of the countries in which their plants operate. This is another one of those ones that, so this may be true, uh, the, and this is one where your own outside, outside knowledge, if you have experience with global business and internationalization, this may well be very common. I don't know. I teach GMAT over the internet. Um, however, what foreign companies, and or more specifically foreign countries, what foreign countries and foreign governments do is outside the scope of this passage. You notice how they keep bringing this up. Um, clearly, this is something that uh, people who deal in this line of work probably deal with all the time, uh, different import restrictions placed by different companies or countries, um, different countries on different companies. Um, but again, it's outside the scope of the passage and therefore not correct. Um, D, companies that are not United States owned may seek legal protection from import competition under United States import relief laws. Well, that's exactly what happens in paragraph four in the specific, uh, specific example. And paragraph three, of course, stated that as a general concept. So that sounds really good. Um, E, companies in the United States that import raw materials may have to pay duties on those materials. Psst. Raw materials are never mentioned. So yeah, it's definitely D that uh, foreign foreign companies based in the U.S. Um, can seek protection against U.S. companies, or just seek protection, um, import protection in general, potentially from other international companies. Okay, number sixty-eight. The passage suggests that which of the following is most likely to be true of United States trade laws. So the passage suggests is another inference question. Um, and when we find out about US trade laws, yeah, I think it's gonna e either be the stuff in the second or third paragraph because the first one is just more about the ITC. 
the, for, the fourth paragraph is just this specific case. So how companies, how this affects things at the company level is really paragraph two and three. So our answer, if, if anywhere, is probably going to be there, but we need to see what, those, what the answer choices actually say. Uh, does the passage suggest that United States trade laws A will eliminate the practice of dumping products in the United States? Um, no. <laughs> uh, if it would eliminate the practice, they wouldn't have people claiming it. Um, so um, it's still clearly going on, or people are at least alleging that it's going on. Uh, B, will those laws enable manufacturers in the United States to compete more profitably outside the United States? Again, what goes on in foreign countries is outside the scope of the passage. Um, C, they will affect United States trade with Canada more negatively than trade with other nations. This one's meant to catch the skimmers because Canada gets mentioned in the fourth paragraph, but really um, in the passage, nobody cares about Canada more than other countries. Um, D, those, uh, those that help one unit within a parent company will not necessarily help other units in the company. Hmm. So back in line, back in, uh, I guess it was the second paragraph. Yeah. Um, yeah, parent company appears in the second paragraph. So let's go just go back and read that. Um, the complexity of these relationships makes it unlikely that a system of import relief laws will meet the strategic needs of all the units under the same parent company. And choice D says those that help one unit within a parent company will not necessarily help other units in the parent, in the company. So that sounds a lot like what's in the passage, but not exactly the same, and that's why this is an inference. Let's check E. Uh, the, the, so we're talking about laws. Those that are applied to international companies will accomplish their intended result. Well, nothing in the passage really accomplishes its intended result, so um, it has to be D. Ta-da! Oh, I hit the wrong button again. Well, we were almost done anyway. Uh, page 385. I will be glad when I'm done with reading comprehension and I can just go back to erasing after every question. Um, for those of you who weren't watching the broadcast before, of course, that's what I did after every quant question. So that's why it's force of habit for me to erase the whole thing. Anyway, question number 69. It can be inferred from the passage that the author believes which of the following about the complaint mentioned in the last paragraph. Well, uh, the, the last paragraph, the author mentions that it was a brazen um, case. And brazen, like I said, means bold or outrageous. Maybe even... Um, it has a kind of a negative uh, connotation, actually. So it's not just bold, where bold is can be brave, you know? Um, brazen can be perhaps contrary to what people think somebody ought to do, daring to the point of um, infringing on the expectations or rights of others. I made that, I mean, you know, that's just my attempt at a definition. You may want to look it up later. Maybe I'll even look it up while you all are reading the, past, the next passage, and then I'll read you the dictionary definition because I can do that in a live broadcast. Anyway, question number 69 uh, was about the uh, complaint mentioned in the last paragraph and what the author believes. Does the author believe, A, the ITC acted unfairly toward the complainant in its investigation? So a quick scan of paragraph four reveals that all we know about what the ITC did is that they investigated this claim. There is no uh, mention of how this was resolved. Okay, so uh, it cannot be that the ITC acted unfairly. The ITC just investigated for all we know. Uh, B, the complaint violated the intent of import relief laws. The word brazen might actually imply that, so we'll keep that. Um, C, the response of the ITC to the complaint provided suitable relief from unfair trade practices to the complainant. Again, we don't find out how the ITC actually acted in this case, just that they investigated or it investigated. The good people of the ITC investigated. Uh, choice D, the ITC did not have access to appropriate information concerning the case. Uh, pff, that, uh, sorry, maybe that sounded attractive to you. I don't mean to be dismissive of 
uh, your choices, you out there on the internet, but um, we appropriate information does not appear anywhere in the passage, even the idea of it. It's not about how the case is investigated, just who was making the case against whom. That's what the problem is with uh, the one in the last paragraph. Uh, choice E, each of the companies involved in the complaint acted in its own best interest. Hmm. The author might believe that. Okay, so, um, but then let's actually uh, just review that again. So we have a choice between B, the complaint violated the intent of import relief laws. Again, it says the most brazen case, and then the, it follows with... Um, the final sentence is the quote unquote United States company claiming injury was a subsidiary of a Dutch conglomerate, while the quote Canadian companies included a subsidiary of a Chicago firm that was the second largest domestic producer of rock salt. So the one, the company that was being investigated was the second largest domestic producer of rock salt, and these laws are meant to protect domestic companies. So that really does sound like violating the intent of import relief laws. Whereas choice E, each of the companies involved in the complaint acted in its own best interest. Um, well, um, of course it's in the complaining company's best interest to um, get relief if possible. Um, I don't think we can really say that the... Uh, the uh, what would we call the... Not the complainant, but the, the target of the complaint... The target of the complaint probably was acting in its own best interest, but it certainly wasn't in its own best interest to be the subject of a complaint. Also, um, the language of the, the fourth paragraph really does sound more like answer choice B than answer choice E. The author doesn't really say, well, they were just doing their jobs or anything like that. Oh, so uh, cross off E and choose B. Okay, so we shall finally erase this. We go on to page 386. You will have, you know, four minutes. This is a long passage. It goes into the second column on the first page of, uh, on page 386. Um, and then we have six questions. So we will be on question number 70. I'll give you four minutes starting now.
Okay, we'll stop there. I wanted to say first that um, I did look up brazen. I'd actually completely forgotten about this, but the original meaning, of course, just means made of brass. And then uh, from there, uh, there would be uh, sounds made of uh, made from brass instruments, which tend to be uh, loud and um, potentially kind of harsh, like a gong or you know brass musical instruments. And that that loudness and the fact that it kind of interrupts and goes over everything else um, made the brazen get, get a more metaphorical meaning of contemptuous boldness. Uh, that contemptuous is the word I was looking for when I was trying to describe how it's not just boldness, but it's boldness kind of uh, with disregard for what other people or or what other um, for whatever else is going on. So it's contemptuous boldness in the sense of you know uh, contempt is kind of looking down on uh, or thinking less of other things. And so it's boldness that puts uh, the person who's doing it, um, it uh, prioritizes that person's actions ahead of other people's, at least in their own mind. So there you have it, Brazen. Um, just figured I'd pass that along since I could. Anyway, um, the passage is about um, the, the testability of Milankovitch's theory um, and and how that's tested via this uh, new measure of oxygen isotopes in ocean sediment. So um, mostly it's about how this, this newly kind of discovered ratio of the two isotopes of oxygen in ocean sediment allow us to uh, gauge the relative amounts of land ice, which then allows us to tie, um, because it's in the sedimentary record, we can tie um, the amount of oxygen in the water um, to the amount of land ice, and, and because it's a continuous record, we can then figure out the approximate chronology and compare that to the Earth's orbit and see whether ice ages are actually caused by variations in the Earth's orbit or by something else. So um, uh, the author, and again, that, that, uh, that key element, does the author recommend that we do anything? Um, not particularly, no. The author is not saying, hey, this new theory is awesome, or actually really in this case, it's an old theory. It's the early 20th century. Um, and uh, the author isn't saying, hey, we should do a certain thing. It's really more of an explanation. So if we get a uh, main idea question, uh, something where the author is arguing for something isn't going to be likely to be true. Anyway, on to question number 70. In the passage, the author is primarily interested in, so here's our main idea question, um, was the author interested in suggesting an alternative to an outdated research method? Um, there is no outdated research method in the passage, so it's not A. Is the author interested in introducing a new research method, method that calls an accepted theory into question? We are not bringing a, an accepted theory into question. In fact, there isn't really an accepted theory mentioned in the passage. Uh, C, emphasizing the instability of data gathered from the application of a new scientific method. There's no instability. Uh, D, presenting a theory and describing a new method to test that theory. Uh, and that sounds a lot like what we have. Um, there was uh, Milankovitch's theory in the early 20th century, and now we have a means to test that theory. We'll keep that one. Um, e, initiating a debate about a widely accepted theory. Um, nope, there's no widely accepted theory, and there's certainly no, the, no initiation of debate. So that leaves us with D, presenting a theory and describing a new method to test that theory. I'm going to hit the right button this time because I have a lot of notes. Not saying I'm gonna, not going to accidentally delete my notes later on, but um, I'm going to try not to. It's good to have achievable goals. Question number 71. The author of the passage would be most likely to agree with which of the following statements about the Milankovitch theory. So, um, and my apologies to um, Milankovitch uh, if I and, and his or her relatives uh, if I am mispronouncing his name, but I think that's right. Anyway, um, anyway, the passage, the author of the passage would be most likely to agree, quote, is uh, one of the formats of an inference question. And where do we hear about the um, um, Milankovitch theory that's mostly the first paragraph 
Um, and then it's not, and then it's not mentioned again until the last paragraph. So in the first paragraph, um, we find out that the theory is untestable, and then in the last paragraph, the uh, fourth paragraph, um, says that it is testable, and um, yeah, that uh, it looks it looks pretty good, and that the ice ages do, and we find out in the previous paragraph that it's tied to the Earth's orbit, but that there are other factors. That's what the fourth paragraph is. Okay, so the author would agree then, would the author agree that A, it is the only possible explanation for the ice ages? Well, the author does go out of his or her way to explain that other factors like volcanic um, particulate matter in the atmosphere and things like that, other factors can contribute to ice ages. So um, clearly Milankovitch's theory is not sufficient on its own. Um, B, it is too limited to provide a plausible explanation for the Ice Ages despite recent research findings. The third paragraph really talks about how good this new research method with the oxygen isotopes um, is, and that uh, the evidence so far really is quite strong in connecting um, the amount of land ice to points in the Earth's orbit. So, it's probably not limited and probably not implausible. I mean, really, there's no reason to think that the author thinks it's implausible. Um, uh, C, it cannot be tested and confirmed until further research on volcanic activity is done. Well, it actually says outright um, in line 53, the advantage of the Milankovitch theory is that it is testable. Changes in the Earth's orbit can be calculated and dated by applying Newton's laws of gravity to progressively earlier configurations of the bodies in the solar system. So um, the author clearly would not agree that Milankovitch's theory cannot be tested. D, it is one plausible explanation, though not the only one, for the ice ages. Um, right, well, um, basically on this one, you know, the whole passage is really about the Milankovitch theory and how it's now testable. Um, and that so far the initial uh, data that they've gotten is promising, but the author does go out of his or her way to explain that there are other factors that the Milankovitch theory does not account for and that the um, this oxygen isotope business does nothing to, to tell us about um, volcanic particulates or variations in the amount of sunlight received by the Earth. Um, so, um, and so the author says the lack of information about other possible factors affecting global climate, i.e. other sources of ice ages, does not make them unimportant. So it suggests that the author thinks there could be other things going on. We'll keep that one in check E. Um, it is not a plausible explanation for the ice ages, although it has opened up promising possibilities for future research. Uh, I think we, we see that the author does think that it is plausible. Um, the third paragraph talks about how great the oxygen isotope thing is and how much it matches. Uh, that's for that tied to orbit thing there. It does match Milankovitch's theory, so it is plausible. It's just it doesn't account for other things which clearly do affect climate. So it's not E and it is D. We'll move on to the next page. Page 387, question number 72. It can be inferred from the passage that the isotope record taken from ocean sediments would be less useful to researchers if which of the following were true. Okay, well, um, the second paragraph and the third paragraph both talk about this isotope business. The second paragraph is really long. It's probably about as long as the rest of the passage combined, so I'm not just going to go and read all that out loud. Just know that we're probably going to have to look back at those two, those two parts of the passage in order to verify our answers. So um, can we infer from the passage that the isotope record indicated that lighter isotopes of oxygen predominated at certain times? Oh no, sorry, that the isotope record would be less useful if it indicated that lighter isotopes of oxygen predominated at certain times. Um, 
No, in fact, uh, choice A actually strengthens the isotope theory because again, while they were looking for the heavier isotope of oxygen, that's O18, the more O18 there is, the more land ice there is. If there are times when there is, there is more O18, then clearly there are also times when there is more O16. So the fact that lighter isotopes of oxygen predominated at certain times backs up the theory. And in fact, O16 should predominate more in times when there is less land ice, according to this theory. So A is the reverse of undermining the um, isotope theory business, the isotope record. Uh, B, it had far more gaps in its sequence than the record taken from rocks on land. So um, remember, in paragraph 3, we find out that this uh, the ocean sediment isotope record is listed as being good because um, it has little variation globally and it's more continuous than the land version. If they find out that it actually has more gaps in its sequence than the record taken from rocks on land, then it would not be as good as stated by paragraph 3. So uh, basically I'm almost certain choice B is the right answer here. Um, but let's check the other ones. Uh, C, it indicated that climate shifts did not occur every 100,000 years. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, again, uh, it wouldn't necessarily need to um, coincide with every ice age, but um, it would need to coincide with some of them to still be a valid theory, especially since the author mentions that there are other contributing factors. So, um, yeah, I don't think we can, we can, I mean, it's still kind of tempting though, so I guess we'll keep it. Um, D, if it indicated that the ratios of oxygen 16 and oxygen 18 in ocean water were not consistent with those found in fresh water. Kind of tempting because, of course, it makes the record um, less clear. However, this whole thing with the ocean, uh, with the uh, O18 and o O16 isotopes is that it really is only about ocean sediment. What happens with lake sediment is irrelevant to the theory. So um, even if there is... Uh, less, or even if there are different ratios in fresh water, um, it doesn't matter because the theory is really only backed up by ocean sediment. Um, and then choice E, it stretched back for only a million years. Well, a million years would still give you 10 100,000 year cycles. And so that would be a lot of ice ages to track. So uh, going back a million years would in fact be plenty. And in fact, uh, what it says in line 41 to, starting in line 42, it says the dated isotope record shows that the fluctuations in global ice volume over the past several hundred thousand years have a pattern. So if it goes back a million years, that's great. They've only tracked the last several hundred thousand years. They still have more, more stuff to look at. So um, it's not E. Let's go back to C versus B. Um, and... So we know that an ice age occurs once, r roughly once every 100,000 years. Um, so even if the ocean sediment did not indicate uh, that that happened, uh, that still wouldn't necessarily um, invalidate the isotope uh, record because we do know that the ice age occurred already. It doesn't... That would potentially invalidate the idea of ice ages. We know that those occur. Um, we just need the ocean sediment stuff to um, to coincide in some way with ice ages. So it's not going to be C. It is going to be B. Okay, home stretch number 73. According to the passage, which of the following is true of the ratios of oxygen isotopes in ocean sediments? So the ratios of the oxygen uh, sediment, uh, isotopes is in paragraph 2, the really long one. So we'll have to look back there for our answers for something that looks true. Uh, A, they indicate that sediments found during an ice age contain more calcium carbonate than sediments formed at other times. Um, no, that's not true. <laughs> um, we find out that, um, where was that? Oh, that the calcium carbonate 
um, is just formed from the water in the ocean, and it's just this. It's basically it's basically the storage mechanism for seeing how much um, of the various ice, oxygen isotopes are there. There's not more or less of it, just the stuff that there is 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 what stores our isotopes. So it's not A. Um, they are less reliable than the evidence um, from rocks on land in determining the volume of land ice. Actually, paragraph three told us that basically it's better, so it's not true. Um, C, they can be used to deduce the relative volume of land ice that was present when the sediment was laid down. So that's kind of line 29-ish. The higher the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 in a sedimentary specimen, the more land ice there was when the sediment was laid down. So that sounds ridiculously awesome. D, they are more unpredictable during an ice age than in other climatic, climatic conditions. Uh, no, we have nothing about their, them being unpredictable, actually. There's little variation, and, and it's more continuous. So not D. Uh, e, they can be used to determine atmospheric conditions at various times in the past. Well, saying that it's atmospheric conditions is definitely beyond the scope of the passage. It's really just about the amount of land ice. So it's not E, and it is, in fact, choice C. I almost, whoops, almost deleted the whole thing. Number 74. It can be inferred from the passage that precipitation formed from evaporated ocean water has, and precipitation is, um, that's around line 20, basically. Um, It says, uh, so the evaporated ocean water is actually line um, 21 and 22. So because heavier isotopes tend to be left behind when water evaporates from the ocean surfaces, the remaining ocean water becomes progressively enriched in oxygen 18. So we want something like that. So precipitation, the water that gets away from the ocean, has A, the same isotopic ratio as ocean water. Uh, no, because clearly we just found out that the O18 gets left behind, so it can't have the same ratio. Uh, B, less oxygen 18 than does ocean water. So since the O18 is left in the ocean water, in theory, the precipitation, the rain that comes from water evaporated from the ocean, where it left more of its O18 behind, that precipitation should have less O18. So that sounds good. Uh, C, less O18, sorry, less oxygen 18 than has the ice contained in continental ice sheets. Really, it's about ocean water versus everything else, not about um, stuff, what, stuff in the air versus continental ice sheets. This is outside the scope. Um, D, a different isotopic, uh, I wonder if it's isotopic or isotopic. I'll look it up later. Maybe I'll report back, but it's not that important. Uh, we'll go with ice. I don't know. I'll just say it however I feel like saying it. Um, the disadvantage, the advantage of the real GMAT is you don't have to read it out loud. Anyway, a different isotopic composition than has um, than has precip precipitation formed from water on land. Again, water on land is outside the scope of the passage, so we can't really infer anything about that. Um, e more oxygen than has precipitation formed from fresh water. Again, fresh water is the stuff on land, um, lakes and streams and stuff. Um, salt water, ocean water is really all that's in question. So that leaves us with answer choice B, less O18 than ocean water. Last one. Number 75. It can be inferred from the passage that calcium, calcium carbonate shells um, and we find out about them in the long paragraph too, so we're just going to have to hope that we can fetch the answer from um, from that paragraph if we need to when we need to support it. So are those shells a not as susceptible to deterioration as rocks? Um, well, we don't actually find anything about deterioration of calcium carbonate uh, or rocks on land. So I mean. 
No, <laughs> that's outside the scope. Are they less common in sediments formed during an ice age? Uh, no, it's that's the storage mechanism. It doesn't. We have nothing about the increase or decrease in the substance. Just that um, the composition of the calcium carbonate is what changes. Um, are they found only in areas that were once covered by land ice? Wow, that's ridiculously untrue. It's found in the ocean, which is almost never covered by land ice. Um, if it were covered by ice, it wouldn't be land ice because it would be over water. No, I suppose it's true that glaciers can extend out over, um, over the water, but uh, I think that's what's going on in Greenland, for example. But um, no, they are not found only in areas covered by land ice or that were once covered. Um, do they contain radioactive material that can be used to determine a sediment's isotopic composition? No, no radioactive material. Oxygen is not normally considered a radioactive material. So the process of elimination gets us to E. E says uh, the calcium carbonate shells reflect the isotopic composition of the water at the time the shells were formed. And sure enough, um, uh, line 24 says the degree of enrichment can be determined by analyzing ocean sediments of the period because these sediments are composed of calcium carbonate shells of marine organisms, shells that were constructed with oxygen atoms drawn from the surrounding ocean. Um, and then the next line is the one I read before. The higher the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 in a sedimentary specimen, the more land ice there was when the sediment was laid down. So um, because the calcium carbonate is formed by little critters um, in the water at the time um, in their shells, um, that reflects the isotopic composition of the water at the time. So. Anyway, that leaves us with choice E, clearly, as the correct answer, <clears throat> not just by process of elimination, but by support from the actual passage. And I think we'll stop there. And I mean, I know we'll stop there. It's up to me anyway. But we had published that this is where we were going to stop. And um, yeah, um, we will start on page 388 next time. It's time to clear this off. So next time, we will start on page 388 with question number 76. And uh, we will not have a broadcast the next two days. I am taking off uh, the next two days for New Year's holidays. Uh, but we will be back on January 2nd, as normal, um, with the aforementioned question. So you've been watching Grockett's OG TV. This is the GMAT edition. I'm Jim Jacobson. And um, this is the uh, using the 12th edition of the guide. Stay tuned next time. We will continue with reading comprehension. And we're actually getting relatively close to done. Um, there are 139 questions. And we get through uh, 7 to 10 per time. I guess we're about half done. Um, so we'll be done within uh, a few weeks. A couple weeks, I guess. So anyway, see you next time.